Welcome back to Three Point Firefighter, the podcast where I have conversations with firefighters all around the country on all things fire service related, especially those three things that I think are the foundation for any good firefighter, pride, training, and physical fitness. Now, follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Three Point Firefighter. Also, my contact info will be down in the description. Today's guest is Battalion Chief Corley Moore of Moore Fire Department in Oklahoma. Now, he's been a firefighter since 1997. He is a devoted husband and a proud father of three kids. Chief Moore runs Firehouse Vigilance and is driven by the never-ending fight against complacency. He also runs a live weekly webcast on YouTube called The Weekly Scrap and has a podcast of the same name. And if that wasn't enough, he also wrote a book on leadership called Challenger Leadership. Chief Moore loves the fire service, and he's dedicated to making it better. You only have to talk to him for a few moments to see and hear his passion for the job. I was very excited to have him on Three Point Firefighter. And with that, Chief Corley Moore. All right, Brother Corley Moore from Oklahoma. How you doing, brother? Doing great. How you doing this morning? Doing well. Thanks for being on my podcast, and thanks for having me on your podcast. Absolutely. You know I'm a fan of uh, of the weekly scrap and, and a week, and I'm a big fan of Firehouse Vigilance. Uh, and what is your what is your um, your motto for Firehouse Vigilance? I love it. The never ending fight against complacency. Right, right on, man. So tell me about how you came to that. I tell you what, I'm sorry, I got to back no, up. No, Let me back up. Tell me about your fire department, and tell me where you fit in there. Okay. Uh, currently, I am. I work at the Moore Fire Department. I always have to tell people no relation. Right. But my name is on the side of all the trucks. <laughs> uh, battalion chief, which is a shift commander. Okay. Uh, we have four stations, roughly 23 guys on my shift that I'm uh, directly responsible for. Uh, that's where I fit in in it. Uh, I just became a battalion chief in 2019, shortly before the pandemic kind of got going. So uh, that was the adjustment of getting off the engine and becoming a white shirt was kind of a... Uh, what do you call it? A mind screw yeah. as I adjusted and figured out, is this something I want to do or not? But uh, very happy now in the position and loving it. Good. Good deal. And where is more Oklahoma at? Uh, if you, if you know the pan shaped Oklahoma, we are dead center of the, the mass of Oklahoma city is right in the middle. More is directly South of Oklahoma city. It okay. is a suburb. So uh, so Oklahoma are city, in, more huh? and then Norman, if you know where OU is at. Yes. I used to live yeah. in Wichita falls. Okay. Yeah. That's it. So now are you in the tornado alley? Oh, we are tornado alley. Right, okay. So I <laughs> live there too in Wichita Falls. Uh, I'll tell you a little story about that. So from Frankfort, Kentucky, lived in Lexington, Kentucky. We get tornadoes up here, but they're not as having lived in Wichita Falls. We don't get near the amount of tornadoes or the destruction as tornado alley really. Um, so they, they're always kind of a scary thing up here, right? So you hunker down and do all the stuff. Sure. Well, when Uncle Sam said you need to go to Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, I moved down there. And one of the first days I was there was a tornado, tornado warning. And everybody was outside like grilling and like it was nothing. They were so used to tornadoes. <laughs> right. And I, I didn't have a basement. And I went over to my, I was a duplex on base. I said, is there a basement? And they're like, no, oh, man, it's just a tornado warning. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and they, and when I, since as long as I lived there, tornadoes were i'm not saying they weren't taken seriously but people were they knew how to handle you know they they it's knew a, the it's difference. a way of life yeah it's a way of life now you've had several tornadoes like devastating tornadoes come through more right yes we had two f5s um which they almost changed the classification and created the f6 after the 99 tornado but they just kept they did the modified fujita scale uh but yeah two f5s one f4 and then probably i want to say six or seven F3 and belows that have come through more during my career. And the first one was you had just been on for a little while, right? Yeah. I hired on in 97, February of 97 and, and May 3rd, 99 was, was the bad boy that came through and, and laid down some massive devastation. Now, if you weren't on duty at the time it happened, you obviously were on duty shortly thereafter, right? Yeah. No, I wrote it out at, in, you know, in more in my storm shelter. And when I came out, you know, this was, you know, 99 cell phones weren't everywhere. They were, they existed, but all the power was gone. Uh, I went inside and I picked up my landline for those who are old enough to remember landline, <laughs> but for whatever reason, it still had, it still worked. I called dispatch and I said, is, is, are we coming in? And they're like, yes. And hung up on me just instantly like, yes, click. <laughs> and so, and then I think we worked, I don't think I went back home for four days 
just catching cat naps where you could as we uh, responded to that. A lot of search and rescue, I take it. Man, uh, initially, when I got to the station, all the rigs were gone except for a 1972 International with a 427. Had a, uh, didn't even have jump seats. It just had a tailboard like back in the day. Right. And uh, I know uh, Dennis Grove, one of our old drivers, or he's retired now, but he was one of the more senior drivers. He jumped in and drove that, and me and Rick Means, a major at the time, rode actual tailboard to respond to the command post where – there was a big header off in the distance and we got to take that old international and I got to go fight fire initially. So I was extremely lucky to not be, I say lucky, but uh, I got to fight fire during it as opposed to uh, search and rescue and, and digging through debris. Oh yeah. That's the way to go. Now, have you had oh, you rode tailboard before that? No, that was the only time. That's one of my things. I actually rode, you know, holding the bar, standing up on the back. And uh, so that's the only rig we had. It, it was retired shortly after that. So. When I first started in Wichita Falls in the Air Force, we rode tailboard. Uh, all, I mean, that was we always rode tailboard. Really? Right? Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Man. And I always tell people, firefighters like to romanticize tailboard. It was miserable. It, I mean, it was miserable because if you had a bad driver, and like you said, that bar's right here, and you hit your head. If that, if you had a new driver, uh, when it was cold, it was, you know, in Texas. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine. It was horrible if it's raining. So, all these young firefighters come on and go, oh, man, I wish I could ride tailboard. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah. I mean, it sounds cool. And maybe a little, like if it's a nice 70-degree day and you got a good driver, it's a blast, you know? Right. But, man, I had more bad times riding tailboard than I ever did. I, uh, you have a better experience with it than I did. Because mine, mine, like you said, mine's very romanticized because it was the one time I got to do it ever, right. you know? And I got to do it going to fight fire. Yeah. So. Yeah, we used to uh, do that and then – the tarp over the hose in the back, that was our thing. If it's raining or cold, which was, you know, quite a bit, just throw it over your head and you'd have to kind of hang on to the sides there oh, a little bet. bit. That could yeah. be quite miserable. I could imagine. Because even oh, yeah. old open, open dog houses could be miserable in the rain when you just oh, yeah. stick it in there next to the dog house. Absolutely. Know. Now, if you were, now that's going to runs. I probably should qualify this a little bit. If you're driving around doing like going to the store, pre-planning, stuff like that, and it's not miserable, you know, cold or whatever, it's a pretty nice day. It is fun. Okay. It, it, if you want people to wave at you, ride tailboard. Nice. Because everybody waves at you. So. I can only imagine. Yeah. The, the, the PR on it would be, I'm not oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. That'd yeah, be dope. Yeah. Anyway. So uh, you had to fight a little fire on that one. And how yes, long sir. did you say you, you were on at that time? Uh, just, just right at two years. Okay. So you were still, still a young pup. Yes. Very much so. Okay. And then the next one came through quite a, like what, 13 years later, the next F5. The next F5, yeah, it was 2013. Okay. I hope I don't get the date wrong, but 2013. All right. And how, now, so now you got, now you're a fireman, you're salty. Oh, yeah. I was Tell a lieutenant. Uh, I had made driver and promoted to lieutenant. So Tell me about that, that experience compared Again, to the first one. I was off duty. I was actually tiling my master bathroom shower. So I was in there just, I had music going, you know, and I'm not, you know, it's, it's more Oklahoma. We're not really paying too much attention to the weather. My kids are in school. I'm home by myself. I'm slapping tile up on the wall. And one of my kids called me from school. This time we did have cell phones. Right. She called me from school and said, dad, uh, should I come home? And it's, it's right around three o'clock. So they're about to get out of school. I'm like, yeah, school's out. Come home. She's like, no, can you come get me? And so I was like, yeah, what's going on? She goes, they're saying there's tornadoes coming. And so I actually got up and turned on the, the weather and I'm like, holy smokes. Uh, I drove to junior high, picked up my son and it was a half mile away and picked up my daughter, came home and we basically raced to the storm shelter it passed about a half mile from us. So oh, wow. uh, where we lived at the time uh, and it's all the typical stuff. It sounded like a freight train going by and everything like that. Oh, yeah. When I came out, you know, there's debris, uh, it's fine debris, you know what I'm saying? From being thrown, mm -hmm. settling. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to work. And my sister-in-law pulled up. She took my kids. I drove to work. And as I'm driving to work, uh, fire trucks from surrounding districts are passing like uh, cross streets heading South. I'm like, whoa, maybe it's serious. Because at the time, I had no idea how serious it was. Right. And I got to the station. And again, all the rigs were gone except a brush rig. And uh, picked up the landline at the station and called dispatch and said where we needed. And she said there's reports of uh, victims trapped at Plaza Towers Elementary. And uh, the rookie showed up. My rookie showed up at the, at the same time. And he'd just been assigned to me. And we grabbed a five-gallon bucket and threw a whole bunch of medical supplies into a five-gallon bucket, threw it in the... Uh, brush rig and we took off down to plaza towers elementary and i remember driving the the residential area there surrounding 
the uh, school and just driving and heading south to the, you know, the school. And I'm looking around going, this ain't that bad. This isn't that bad. This is nothing like 99. This is nothing like 99. And then we made that final turn to where uh, we actually got to the path that they'd passed through. And it was just a holy shit moment of this is worse. Complete devastation. Like, yeah. Oh, just like that. Yeah. Uh, the school just didn't exist anymore. It was just rubble. Oh, wow. And so and that was, that was a long day. So. And that's when you did have to go sift through rubble and oh, yeah. find and people. We, we pulled them. And, uh, you know, and it, it was a tragedy. Uh, and, but it is what it is. Mother nature came through and let, laid low two elementary schools at, you know, right when they were full of kids. So God. luckily there was only the six, the six that, that perished. So. Now that was the one that was like all over the news, wasn't it? Yeah. At the time. Yeah. I kind of remember that a little bit. Yeah. That's gotta be, that's gotta be pure hell to go through, man. When, when it, kids change everything on this job. There's they no doubt about it. When people ask me, you know, what's the best, best thing about the job. And eventually they ask me, what's the worst thing about the job. And I tell them both it, it's kids, same, kids. same answer. You both know, ways. You, yeah. Yeah. That's a really way, good way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, you, you, the kids are more durable and you know, there's nothing better than going to a school and showing them your fire truck and, or when they come in and, and look at your firehouse and all that. And then when they're hurt or injured or worse, it's, 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 I mean, really that's to me, that's, that's the best and the worst of our job. There's no doubt. I, yeah. I've never heard it put quite that way, but it, that really is. I, I've always heard, I mean, for me, no doubt kids, worst part. I, uh, but I, but when you put it, they're also the best. That is a good point. For me too. I had a brand new, when I started the fire service, probably a year later is when I had my first child, my son. So whatever age my kids were at, if I made a run on a kid that age, it was just, it devastated me. It was just like for days, I'd be just a different person. Sure. And then uh, but I'm just, just paranoid. You're a new dad and all that stuff. But Absolutely. now I feel a little bit better about that. But uh, yeah, yeah. Kids are, kids are the best and the worst thing about this job. No doubt about it. So for your department, having endured such devastation with, with uh, and living in Tornado Alley, what, what kind of IAPs did you all put into place or, you know, SOGs, policies, anything? So now it's, you don't have to get a five gallon bucket and fill, you know, fill it with stuff. Well, I mean, that's just strictly, I don't know if, if, if an F5 comes through, I think you're still going to be doing that. I don't think there's enough IAPs or, or anything. If an F5 actually comes through your, your area, you're going to be stuck making do. Right. Um, I think the biggest thing probably is, and we've lost a lot of it over the last few years, is the sheer experience from command down to the line personnel of responding to a, a wide area disaster. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the thing about tornadoes is they're acute as far as they come, they're here, they're here for 30 minutes and gone. And they, they have a pretty defined, uh, when I, when I say acute, as opposed to like a, a hurricane, you know, which is just massive, uh, water destruction and wind, you know, the, the, the tornado is more like a, a laser beam coming down, like, shh, you know, yeah. if that makes sense, the analogy. Oh, it does. Absolutely. Cause a hurricane the, you have, a lot longer till you hit right. the eye of the wall and then you got the back end, back end the same side. So yeah. And that's a lot of devastation too. And um, they can last so long. Like a long tornado is like an hour on the ground. You know? Right. That's a really, really, really long tornado. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and like you said earlier, it's, then you got to go out. Well, you got to go out and find work. You know, you're not called out to every little run. You've got to go out and search and put out fires and, and search for people and all that stuff. So that's a, that's a whole different ball game. And there's a whole bunch of things that, and I, like I said, I'll get back to answering your question, which is the, the sheer amount of command, uh, like from our chiefs and battalion chiefs at the time and our, our, our officers that learned how to respond to those kind of emergencies. And it's not just that the citizens of war, uh, the citizens that live in tornado alley, you know, I remember 99 people walking around like they're shell shocked and, and just like, what, what's going on. And then you, you fast forward through all the little tornadoes in between the F fours and the F threes. And then 2013, uh, people just went to work. They started pulling their neighbors out of each other's houses and, and th there was no shell shock. It was just, it's like you, you alluded to earlier. It's just normal. Um, right. And that's the thing, like you were talking about, you know, people just out barbecue and even though there's tornado watch going on, yeah, you can tell in more or, you know, if you're in the, if you're in the, if you're an Okie that when people start taking it serious, you can almost feel it in the air. If that makes sense. It's like, this, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. There, there's a different vibe when, yeah, absolutely. Right. Like something's not quite right, you know, and you're looking around at these. And so, so, well, this time of year too, you guys are gearing up, I'm sure. Oh, I'm just, uh, I tell you, I, after 24 years now, I, I just get tired of storm season, you know, I'm really? just like, it's just like, man, I just, 
I want it to go by and be a nice mild storm season. Right. So I don't know how many more I want to go through is my point. I, <laughs> I never thought I'd say that, you know what I'm saying? But it's just getting to the point where I'm like, I'm done with the, the, the anticipation slash dread. That, if that makes sense. The, there's a, you know, when you first come on in the fire service, I think most people, they want to make, they think they want to make every run there is for the rest of their career. Oh, no doubt about it. Now, fires are a little bit different. A good I, agree. Stru- I was going to say fires. I, I'll still take a fire any day of the week. Yeah, so. a good structure fireman, especially if you're changing bottles. I always say, you know, um, uh, our my area, my fire department, New Albany, we, so we got five stations. We got about, or should have about 80 people. I think we're a little bit less than that right now. Um, we catch a lot of fires. We really, really do. And it's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's a blast. You know, Such a great, great. I, you, you never want people to have a terrible day, but if it's please let it be on my shift. If it's yeah. going to burn. Yeah. If somebody needs help, I want to help them. Yes. Yeah. But everything else, you know, there's how many motorcycle accidents or car wrecks. I mean, you get to that point, you're like, Oh my God, I really, really don't want to make these anymore. Yeah. It doesn't, doesn't say you don't do your job. I mean, you probably with the experience, you do it a lot better, a lot faster, but uh, old guys would always tell me that I'd be brand new. I'm like, man, I just, I can't wait to make more runs. I don't care what run it is. He, he, he right. was, That'll come out of you. And right. yeah, sure enough, you get to our age, you're like, yeah, if I sleep all night, that's great. That's great. But again, structure fires are a caveat. That's that, I, 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 will, I will take them all day, every day. Oh yeah. I don't. So I had my shoulder surgery. So I was on light duty until about two weeks ago, I think, or a week ago. Gotcha. So I wasn't allowed to be on fire ground scenes. My doctor said, is there any chance of you like helping pull hose? <laughs> right. I'm, like, I'm like, yeah, I mean, if somebody needs something, I got to do it. You know, even though I'm there for either arson or safety. And uh, so I, I had to avoid a few fires. Well, I leave a firehouse and I'm driving down the street and there's a beautiful header. I mean, it was right. like, I drove right up on it. I was like, oh my God, there's, there's one. Like, and we always say on these shotgun house fires, if there's one going, there's going to be two or there's going to be three. And sure enough, uh, there was a good extension and going everything like that. And I was like, wow, man, what am I going to do? Right but uh, yeah, yeah. I think the only casualty in that one was a nice Corvette that was in a garage. Oof. You hate to see it. You hate to see it. Right, right. <laughs> no, no doubt about it, especially a beautiful American muscle car. Oh, absolutely. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit on you. Um, okay. For people that don't know, and I can't imagine there's a whole lot of people, you run Firehouse Vigilance, which we talked about your fight against complacency. Yes, sir. Uh, and you do uh, a podcast and a live, well, you do a webcast, basically, then you turn it into a nice podcast called The Weekly Scrap. And you always have good good people on there. You got you scrape the bottom of the bucket when you got that guy from New Albany. But hey. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey through podcasts, and I'd like to hear yours because uh, sure. I, I so when I started podcasting, I didn't want to um, at all. That wasn't my thing. I think we talked a little bit about that. Uh, but I started looking around. Now, I didn't look in the right places. I didn't think there was a ton of podcasting going on. Uh, I didn't find a whole lot at the time. I probably looked wrong because now I see a ton. Good ones, though, really good ones. But one of the first ones I came across was the Weekly Scrap. Okay. And uh, I loved it. I mean, it was just like, I was already kind of knowing what I wanted. I didn't like my first, my very first one was Jared Sergi and it was more of a question answer. Solid dude too. Yeah. Oh dude, he couldn't be nice. He's my, Love he's him. my unofficial executive producer of the show. Cause he's always getting people on nice. my show for me. He's nice. like, Hey man, can, can interview this guy? Okay, cool. Um, no, I see his book behind you too. So uh, yeah, I know you're a fan. Love the book. Love the book. Right on. It's a great book. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and Sorry. so I'm like, um, what was that one? You got me. Sorry, I completely bamboozled you. Jared oh, Sergi. Oh, oh. So no, I, so I start looking around and I find the weekly scrap and I start watching on YouTube. So I'm at work and as I'm doing computer work, I usually have something going in the background. And I, it was just a weekly scrap, weekly scrap, weekly scrap. And I realized that's the format I want. I want a conversation. I don't want a question and answer. Mm-hmm. And we know there's stuff out there that's question and answer. Sure. And, but the conversation and and you can watch from your first weekly scrap to where you're at now. And it started off really, really good, but it's really, really <laughs> evolved to where I just, I look forward to them. You, know, you, you I, can say it started, it started off rough, but but I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> same, exactly. Same here. I mean, that's, that's kind of my point. But when I saw yours, I really, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't know how to put it into words. And I was like, boom, that's what I want. I want conversations with people like this. Nice. Nice. So big fan of, of Weekly Scrap and Firehouse Vigilance. I hope everybody goes out there and listens to it. We'll brag some more at the end so we tell them, you know, how to find it. Um, well, and you have heavy damn hitters on there. You really do. 
Brother, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll just uh, qualify by saying I, I say this all the time, so it gets old. Uh, people have heard it. I, I'm still surprised that people still uh, say yes and come on. It's like, oh, really? OK, thanks, man. Awesome. Let's do this. Oh, man, I tell you what. And, and you've helped me. You've gave me uh, I'm getting Mark Van Oppen on here. Thanks to you. Awesome. Uh, Dude, but, I love Mark. He's one of and, and the, the never ending fight against complacency comes from one article that, that Mark Van Oppen wrote. That's oh really? Part of the, yeah, he he he, uh, he wrote an article. And I wish I wish I could qualify it better. Um, but, it, but basically, he said the the only way to stop complacency is always be vigilant. And so that's kind of where Firehouse Vigilance came from. And well, that was going to be my next question: is the origin of Firehouse Vigilance? Now, did you start that first, and then it evolved into the YouTube and the podcast? Yes. It initially was. I, so I read a lot. I mean, that's all I, I read every day. I set aside an hour to read and, and I read and I take notes and I'll show you. Like, I have a book around. This is what I do. To, so here's small unit leadership. Great book. If you haven't read it, one of the, one of my go-tos, but you can see the sheer <laughs> amount of, of notes, notes and highlighting. Yeah. Highlights that's covered and, in it. Dude. It, well, this is, this is a, a very dense one. Like the, Normally they don't get that much attention because there's not that, that, that is a great book. If you want to, if you want a great book, small unit oh, leadership. Damn no, it's on my list. Yes. Uh, it's a phenomenal book on leadership, but I study and study and study. And I, the whole reason for all the highlights and I go and I take the highlights and I type them into notes and I put them in my Google drive and I, I try to revisit them is because I hate forgetting what I read. I, I'm trying to lock it all down. I know what's in there, but yeah, I'm trying to, you know, so I would, read all this stuff and try to lock it down. Then I'd write articles. So initially I was writing articles just to share around my department was the whole purpose when it started. And so I made firehouse vigilance, a website just to put the articles on there and share them. But of course, um, whenever you do something around your own department, it was like, yeah, it didn't another question. It, you're, it, you're, it really, you're not a prophet in your own land, right? That's it. And so it was, uh, there was, a, I don't want to say pushback. It's, uh, there's some guys who, who loved it and things like that. But honestly, most of them were like, who care? You know? Right. And so, but the funny part was, is I started making the pictures with my little memes, basically the, the motivational quotes on the fire pictures. Mm -hmm. And those kind of took off on Instagram. Uh, and started getting traction. So that's really why I kept doing it was because those pictures were people would like hit like on it or whatever. And that kind of uh, made me happy. I don't know no, what, another way to say it. So well, it's nice to be to, to reach people, you know, to, I just had a message I wanted to share, which is all this stuff, not my message. It's all this stuff I'm reading that is awesome. Right. And I wanted to share it, you know, and that's really what it came down to. And, uh, but the articles, I would put out an article and it wouldn't get any discussion or any traction or any it's not even about views or anything like that it was just i didn't feel like it was getting i wasn't sharing the message right and my wife is the one who said you should just go on facebook live with your phone and just talk about your articles instead and i was you know and i've told this before but i was like baby don't worry about it i'll do this and you do you and, and, <laughs> and you don't know what you're talking about and so that's you know a huge mistake <laughs> But I, but it wasn't because I did what she said. I tried it out. And I just, instead of writing the articles, I would get my phone and make a recording and talk about whatever topic it was, leadership wise, culture wise, training wise. And again, it wasn't like they blew up or anything like that. But uh, Court Smith, the, the president of the Mid-America Fools at one of our Fools meetings said, hey, why don't you have me on the weekly scrap? Because that's what I called him at the time it was my little weekly scrap. Mm -hmm. And it was supposed to be like scrap, the leftover knowledge. Also scrap, like you're going to get a fight. You know, it's, I don't know why I called it that. You know, it's like. Ooh, double entendre. Yeah. It's <laughs> like when the bands have those terrible names. They're like, why did you name your band? You know, like the Foo Fighters. They're like, we never thought we'd be successful. That's why. Oh. So, <laughs> but um, so the weekly scrap, I love it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, Court was the very first guest. He came on there. And, and that's when I accidentally discovered that I loved having a conversation as opposed to just talking. Right. So and then. I wanted to have conversations with different people. And I just started sending out invites on via social media. Hey, would you like to come on my show, the weekly scrap and discuss, you know, and lo and behold, people started saying yes. And you and, probably, if it's my experience that you had too, it was nothing but yes is probably very humble, very thankful. I mean, these are heavy hitters. You're new to the thing, which obviously now you're a heavy hitter. I mean, you're going to expos, you're doing, you, though, but you are, I mean, you are. And I, I think, I mean, like for me, when you did that double, 
podcast down there at the Floor Expo, I believe. Yes. That was super cool. I was like, the Make New Suburban guys. Yeah. Sean Duffy oh, and uh, uh, Nick Pippard. Yes. And then DJ telling his story, yeah. the VES story, dude. DJ Stone. Oh, yeah. that, was, that was an awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So Good you, are, are you the point to the point now where people are asking you to come on the weekly scrap? I get contacted. I don't, they really don't just come out and ask like, Hey, can I come on your show? They, I've only had a couple guys actually come out and say, Hey, can I be a guest on your show? Most of them don't ask. It's just kind of more like, um, Hey, how's it going? I'm so-and-so. What are you doing? You know? And it's like, what do you want? You know, uh, the you podcaster want and you, yeah. you're like, I'm talking to this guy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, to date, I've only had one person ever tell me no uh as far as coming on that i've asked today right. and that, i'm very proud of that and i think I, with, you know without going to the, i'm pretty sure he was going through some sort of like whether it was a marital problems or divorce or something i'm not sure but that was uh today so yeah like you said nothing but yeses and 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 i have to qualify it by saying uh covid came around about the same time as the weekly scrap started getting going so all of a sudden all of the conferences were canceled and there was a whole bunch of heavy hitters who had nothing else to do, but sit at their homes and maybe get on zoom with, right. with unknown Corley and talk about fire <laughs> stuff. So that really, uh, as far as things, uh, good things that come out of the pandemic for me, uh, the number of guys sitting at home with nothing to do, but talk about fire stuff was really good. You, and I tell you what, I had a hard time in my brain describing why I do what I do. So, and you said, and, and you told me in our last podcast, exactly what it was. You, you described it for yourself. And I'm like, that's it. You're like, I got a keynote speaker all to myself. Yeah. It's a, it's a private lecture. I it's mean, awesome. It's a, it is no, totally it's, awesome. And then that really, to me, that was like, Oh my God, that's exactly why I enjoy this as much as I do. Now for me, I'm, I'm the class clown kind of guy. So people think that this is all I want to do, but I, I honestly, I'm, I'm very introverted. I, I don't want to talk to people. I don't like talking right. on the phone. I don't like that kind of stuff, but I did, also didn't like that. I was that way. So when I got the idea for this, and it stuck in my brain. There was no way it was going away after right. I was reading, you know, Sergi's book. And one of the things that made me do that, and I want to know if it was like this for you, was when I see other people like Sergi, you, Josh Chase, Mark Van Oppen, all these, you know, Snodgrass, they put themselves out there. And there's, at the time, there was a thought in my head that only certain people like that can put themselves out there. It wasn't until I realized interviewing them, interviewing them and doing this podcast that they're just as nervous and really don't want to have the, the spotlight on them. But to your point, they, they've got a message they really have to share. And I wasn't like that for you. Like you nervous about putting yourself out there. You oh, mentioned man. Dude, you talk about the first, those first scraps where I was just recording myself, you know, because and again, it was my wife's idea. So if it crashed and burned, I could blame her. And now I have, I have to give her all the credit, man. It, it was, it yeah, was, it's got to work both ways. <laughs> yeah, no, but no, a hundred percent that nerve wracking. Cause it's bad enough to type up my thoughts on an article and then put it out there and be like, Oh, what are people going to think of this? But to actually, especially like you said, I'm very introverted. Uh, people, a lot of people, I tell them that and they're like, seriously, but, uh, they don't know I, what introvert means really. Right. I like, you guys don't understand. Like if I'm around a ton of people for a long period of time, I have to go stand by myself to get my energy back. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's it. People yes. think that just cause you joke around and, and all that, that you're extroverted, but that's just right. not true. It's how you handle groups, how you handle stress, stuff like that. Stimuli, man. When the TV is on or, and there's noise. In the, I bet, anyway, sorry, I won't get into that. So <laughs> no, no, that's Hey, this is fine. So so you did, did you not want to do this or was you, ner were you just like, I don't know, but was it like, once it's in your head, like in my point, there was no right. way it was going away. No, uh, I, I, there, when, once you have a message and you have to share it, then you don't have a choice, you know? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. It's, it's out of your hands. I think I, maybe other people are wired different, but it sounds like the same thing for you and me Yeah. was once I had the message of uh, chief, chief Terry Scott, he was 37, 38 year chief or firefighter. The more he retired as a battalion chief of the red shift, uh, probably five years, six, maybe, maybe longer now, but he, I never worked on his shift, but he was a mentor to me. And, but he said, the day you quit learning is the day you need to hang up your gear, you know? And that was, that was a big one for him. And that's, you know, one of the reasons he retired was he felt that way, was, right. you know, and, but between him telling me that, you know, and, and he, his quote to me, because when I was filming his retirement video, I film retirement videos for my department 
And I asked Terry, I was like, would you like to be on your retirement video talking to the guys? Because sometimes that's easier than trying to say something to your retirement party. Sure. He's like, yeah. And he did. He did a little spiel. And one of the things he said was the hardest fight you will ever fight in your career is the fight against complacency. And that really was that and Mark Von Oppen's quote are the two things that created Firehouse Vigilance. That's when you had that thing in your head. You're like, okay, I have to do this now. Yes. No, a hundred percent. And there was no stop. So from then on, it was just trying to figure out what vehicle is going to get the message out there. And I tried lots of things. I tried the, the pictures with the, the, the motivational pictures and I'm, I'm still doing those every day. I love those. And uh, they get shared and passed around the uh, articles, original articles uh, and the videos. And then of course the scrap has been what has been the most successful and, and, and through accident, in spite of my best efforts to make it unsuccessful, it has been successful. Because <laughs> when I first started, I was like, okay, no matter what, I'm not going to worry about production value. I'm not going to try and make it good. It's just, it's, it's down and dirty. It's just good content, but who cares about everything else? Well, that, that, that doesn't work because it, me, the guy trying to do that, if I go look for a podcast and I find one and I listen to it and it's got terrible audio, mm -hmm. I just turn it off. I don't listen to it. So why yes. would someone, why would someone listen to mine? Because, you know what I mean? But oh, those yeah. are lessons I had to learn. And like you talked about earlier, my early scraps, they are extremely rough. Right. So uh, the audio I think quality, that's more of a testament though. That's more of a testament to you in building the scrap because some people would see that and go, I just don't have it. I don't got what it takes. I don't have what it takes. But you're like, okay, I'm getting my message out. I'm going to, I'm, now I can work on some of the quality, whatever you, quality you felt like you needed to work on. No, and I'm a stubborn guy too. That's the other part of it is, is I, I probably stick to stuff uh, <laughs> when I should let it go. Uh, but no, uh, and the other part is it was never supposed to be a podcast. Uh, it was just the live videos. That was all it was. And then it started getting traction. And I actually started getting people messaging me on Facebook, sending me emails saying, hey, uh, is there a way to watch this not on Facebook and not on YouTube? Because uh, we just want to listen to the audio. Right. And I was like, I, I guess I can figure that out. And then, so it's, it's probably in the, uh, I was probably in like my thirties or 40th episode when I started making pot and I, and I of course went backwards and turned all the old ones into podcasts, but uh, originally it was never supposed to be a podcast. So that was just a request because people wanted to listen to it in their car or, you know, while they're working out or insert what they don't have to keep their phone open. Right. Well, so, again, accidental. <laughs> I, I usually uh, listen to them. Um, I, sometimes I'll watch you live, but more times than not, since I'm old, I'm going to bed. Mm -hmm. So the next day or whenever you release the podcast is when I start to listen. I'll listen to it at the gym. That's my thing. And it's weird because <laughs> I'll be like on the treadmill or something and you or your guest will say something and out loud, I'll go, yes. <laughs> I'll go preach. You know, people are looking at me like oh, people so. looking over at you like, Hey, this is a yeah, Kyle Ryan That's Barnes. It's just Barnes. He's on the treadmill. Again. <laughs> He's leave alone. But yeah, I, I really enjoy it. And, and it's, uh, I think it's very informative and I like how uh, you, you do way more than just what these people are known for. So my, my, so I told you about my first interview. I didn't think it went very well. Jared Sergi was awesome. I can't wait to have him back on there, but it was more of a question and answer. I was nervous. It was my first one. Oh, I had yeah. way too much notes, you know? <laughs> Uh, and I love I said, it. Yeah, I was like, oh, dude, I love it. I was, uh, it was, I think it was pretty bad. When I looked at it, I was like, I even told my wife, I said, well, oh, to, to my point earlier, I was like, I'm not going to do this. this I'm not right. going to release this. But because it was Jared Sergi and because he has a real message, I had to. And then I got Aaron Fields, who doesn't do a ton of podcasts. Right. No. Yeah. I got, he called me and wanted to talk to me and see where my head was at first, which I thought was super cool. And on the phone, he was just like, just as chill as could be. So his, he was my turnaround. That's when I realized I can't have that many notes. I need to have a loose outline. But I, I so I, and I told you this on your podcast, I interviewed him because I want to talk about nozzle forward. Right. And I realized that's the smallest part of Aaron Fields. Dude. Yeah. He, uh, he is just not that guy. Right. Yes. Honestly, he's probably the guy right now or has been the guy for a while. And then, so he said he's going to come back. He is going to come back. I've been talking to him. Awesome. Uh, but that's when I realized I just wanted conversations. You know, I just want to, hey, tell me about you. So, you know, like, you know, some people want to say, you know, let's talk about fully involved or let's talk trial by fire. Sure. I kinda, that's fine. But I'm more interested in the person behind that. 
Sure. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. they talk about trial by fire and, and nozzle forward all the time. You know, tell me about your department. Tell me how you came up with this stuff. That's where I'm at with that. No, I like it a lot. I enjoy it. Now, I've got a bunch of podcast questions to ask you that I'm not going to do because it's going to be absolutely boring for anybody listening to this. <laughs> right, if you, if <laughs> microphones and lighting. So we'll save that for the end of this uh, after, after we do it. Um, post-production. Post-production, exactly. Now, I, I, so the first, so I listened to Weekly Scrap. Okay. I started with the YouTube videos and the FaceTime videos. Okay. And then I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed on your, and this is how I got a hold of you the first time. I asked you about how you did your, um, uh, what do you call it? your overlays? Overlay. Okay. Yeah. So I, I te- cause I was like, man, I love that. Uh, and again, I'm not releasing my video right away, but I'm, I'm video, I'm doing all, nothing but videos and I will release them. Uh, and you responded back to me and I was like, cool. And I thought at the time I was like talking to Corley Moore is pretty cool. And then you got to hold me a while later about my podcast to ask me to come on your podcast. And I, and I, I think I said this to your podcast. I was, I was in my car with my wife and I was showing her my phone. Look, look, Cor- Corley Moore asked me to be on Weekly Scrap. And was, Who's Corley Moore? What's Weekly Scrap? <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the response I'm used to. Yeah. That's it. I'm, she's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, that's right. You don't listen to Firefighter Podcast. Why would you? Right. Um, so you got a lot of heavy hitters on there. And, uh, one of my favorite, uh, I got to tell you one, of my, and I haven't listened to all of them yet. I've listened to sure. a ton of them. Uh, but uh, one of my favorites, and I want to say it was Von, Von Oppen or Sean Duffy, you were asking about leadership. And you said something to the effect of, you know, what do you, what's a bad leader? And they go, well, they're just a dick. Yeah, Von Oppen's great. <laughs> that yeah. that's, like, that's one of those I was listening uh, when I was at the gym and I just started rolling. I was like, wow. Yes. <laughs> So how many of those guys catch you off guard? Oh, man. Von Oppen, actually. Uh, Brian Brush and Von Oppen, you know, those guys are our are, are best friends. But both of them uh, caught me off guard by spinning the scrap around on me. Because I asked Von Oppen the question. Uh, and this was before I was doing the five questions for firefighters. It was The original one was just, what's the number one problem with the fire or number one issue facing the American fire service. That was the question I would ask every scrap. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was just too negative a question. So I created the five questions, but uh, just to bring, kind of make it more lighthearted and uh, more conversation. But anyway, uh, he turned around and said, I hate that question. He goes, what do you think it is? And I was just like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it caught me off guard. And uh, uh, Brian brush was the same thing. He, t- he, he spun a question back around at me and said, what do you think of this of what I just said? And I was like, um, so uh, it's, it's crazy, especially doing it live, how, right. uh, how fun it can be. I, I, you know what? And that's another thing I was going to tell you. I, I don't know how you do it live. Um, I record all my stuff, usually about a month out. Right now, I'm just like a week out. Uh, but I screw up so much, <laughs> especially well, the, first, the first Join few the ones. Yeah, I was like, I'll say stuff. I'll say the dumbest shit or I'll go um, and I'll just have a brain fart for like 30 seconds. And I go, well, I'll just cut this out. So I don't know how you do it live. Kudos on you because I, I'm thinking about uh, I'm going to Denver for a to, for a train the train the trainer for the UL NIST basement fire class for the okay. society. So ton of heavy hitters down there, and I was thinking about taking my blue Yeti and my camera and do, maybe doing a live one. If not a live one, definitely a regular podcast with. I mean, like uh, you know, you got some big guys down there. So no, absolutely, that'd be awesome. It, now, it, I, I, it I, I don't know. I, I, I'm a trial by error guy. Like even all of this is trial by error to make it work. And so doing live stuff, you know. Well, luckily, we went down to the North Florida Fire Expo, did that live podcast with mm-hmm. Make Do guys. But they had Robert McLeland who put together all those cameras and 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 the the switching to and doing all the audio. I don't uh, I don't know how to put that stuff together yet. So hey, good luck, good luck to you is what I'm saying. Well, the thing about it is, too, it's watching that one. It was seamless. And if you don't know anything, if you're a podcaster, you realize, like you said, it's hard to switch back and forth. you got to have somebody do everything just right. But for the, the viewer, they're just like, well, that's how it's done. But right. There's actually quite a bit of work. Oh, dude, the Robert, that, that, that cat took care of business down there on that thing. Everybody needs a Robert in their pocket. I wish I had one. Yeah. So, <laughs> so do you do all the editing and everything yourself? Yes. Okay. I'm a one-man operation here in this little office of mine. I, I've I found a guy on Fiverr 
and he does excellent work. So oh, I just really? sent him that. Yeah, he, he doesn't charge very much, and he's, he nice. does great work. So that's how I do it. But we're getting into the boring stuff where people are listening and are switching okay, yeah. over. I will say, uh, what was I going to – oh, I had a point. It was going to be a good one. Maybe not. I don't know. Go ahead. If it was how handsome I am, I hear it all the time. You don't that's, have to say that. Okay, so you're tired of that. All yeah. right, never mind. I, I, I get so sick of it. Yes, I'm gorgeous. <laughs> I get that. <laughs> oh, no, I was saying on the scrap, I'm getting to the point, and, I, and, I, and I'll let it go, is you know I do it live, and I try to read the comments – and involve the audience with the guest, you know, mm-hmm. but I'm getting to the point where it's almost getting too much to handle. Because, Especially with bigger, bigger heavy right. hitters. Yes. I, I've noticed that. And so I, let me see if I describe this right for the, for the people that haven't listened to the scrap. And here's why you should listen to scrap. First off, heavy hitters. Second off, your format is really good. It's just conversational stuff. And then uh, third is you, you do a couple of things. <clears throat> you do the book, you ask every uh, guest, what book, and it doesn't even have to be a firehouse book, it just to be right. a book, um, which I think is super interesting because you really could tell a lot about what people read. Oh, there's or, no or doubt. Watch. Oh, yeah. Yes. And then you got your five questions. So you always end up with the book and the five questions. So real quick, let's tell everybody what your five questions always are. They're the same questions every time. Every time. Uh, number one issue facing the modern fire service. Right. And, the, and, and, the, and I have to always tell the guest, there is no right answer, just your opinion. Right. And then I'll give you points based on, However, I feel about your answer, and it's completely arbitrary. And so far, I've got mo- more points than anybody. <laughs> max points. I got max points. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, that's the first question: is number one issue face the modern fire service, and it's really just about them articulating uh, and working through the, their answer. And right. then the second one: um, what are they most excited about for the future of firefighting? Right. And I, I love that question because you know, the probably the number one answer is the younger generation coming in. You know. And then the second answer is probably my own answer, which is technology. But then you get some uh, different views on that. Mm -hmm. uh, And it's interesting. Uh, Number three is the best, excuse me, best position to be in, in the fire service, best rank. And why, of course, is the most important part. You get all kinds of answers there. Oh, yeah. You Uh, made me qualify mine. I I try to make everybody qualify (laughs) because I, uh, so. You said uh, training officer. (laughs) I'm more, I'm more interested in why they think that's true than, uh, than, than their answer. You know what I'm saying? Right. And that's the, that's the interesting part to me. Uh, and then um, the best advice you've ever received. That's the number four. Mm-hmm. And then the final question, which is heavy fire, searchable space. Would you rather be on the nozzle or first in on VES? Right. And so that's the five questions for firefighters. That's it's great. It's great. Oh, the um, answers are what make it. I mean, yeah, the, the yeah. Sorry. Well, it, it's the answers and then your discussion. So yes. there's times where you take the answer, you make a little bit of a comment, you roll on to the next question. But that's not what I live for. I live for when it gets you thinking and you start oh, yeah. a conversation. Like you, you'll do several minutes on one question. Like, oh yeah, I didn't think about that. And it's it's very telling. It's very insightful to your guest and yourself when you go, oh man, I, I didn't think about that. And then you always catch yourself and go, okay, we gotta go on the next. Gotta question. get back to these questions. <laughs> no, and that's one of the, the one of the keys to scoring the five questions. When I because I say it's arbitrary, but one of my things is if they get me to start talking mm-hmm. and discussing, then they get max points because they got me to to get off track. So again, uh, I am, I'm one of the max point club members. <laughs> I'm proud of that. I need to put up a leaderboard. Yeah. 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 Let's put everybody but below I, I me. Really, obviously. I really do try. I try very hard to not make it like soft serve. Oh, anybody who comes on there gets max points, max points, max points. No, no. I noticed that. Cause uh, I, th- I beat Stephen Miller for sure. Is it Stephen Miller, the doctor from uh, Charleston? Uh, they, uh, Griffin. Griffin. That's it. That's it. Yeah. I was thinking of Steve Miller brand. He's saying abracadabra, right? No, right. that's not it. Um, so, yeah, that's true. And then uh, also for people who don't know, you can watch live when you do it and ask questions. And, and, and Corley will go through the questions as quick as he can. But the bigger the name, the more the questions. Regardless, you have heavy hitters asking questions, too, online, which I think is really cool. No, it, that, that has really started coming on lately as uh, past alumni have logged in uh, to watch it live and throw questions at the current guest. You know, it's just fun. Yeah, um, it, it really is. And and the cool part is, uh, you know, when you say heavy hitter, it's not like a, a title you earn. It's the, uh, they're heavy hitters for a reason. It's because they have a strong message and they have a strong repertoire. Right. So when they bring a question, it's usually very insightful, uh, you know, at, on its own right. So Absolutely. anyway, I, I, I like to call them landscapers because we're changing the landscape of fire service. Oh, that's nice. I like yeah, that. I like, I like that. that. Uh, who was it? One of my guests said you should you should call it landscape evolvers. 
because we like, you know, we don't like the word change. We like, you know, we could probably see evolve. evolve. Okay. I like it. Yeah. Tryerman hate change. There's no doubt about it. Oh, they do. So when, when you asked me to be on there, I was nervous. I was like, nobody's going to know who I am. Nobody's going to ask questions, but I, I got quite a few questions and quite a you know, few people. Oh yeah, outside. absolutely. Brother, uh, the thing is, and I, I, uh, I, I'm not, the scrap is known for the big names it's had on it. And I, right. I'm very proud of that. Do not get me wrong, but there are people that come on that uh, aren't, on, aren't Frank Viscuso and aren't Mark Von Oppen and aren't Aaron Fields, you know, uh, and those guys, every time I, I'm, I end the conversation and I'm like, wow, that, I'm so glad I met this person. Just like our conversation. I feel right. like, I feel like I make a new friend each time. And I know that sounds trite, right? But there's it's like true, this, ki- this, this kinship, this connection that you get. And so I never would have dreamed of that over a video conference conversation. Oh, absolutely. But, and but it's, it's like, you can text them. Like yes. I, I stay in contact with all of mine. I'll get texts back and uh, ask questions and stuff like that. It is really cool. Yeah. You do. You make, you make friends. You really do. Yes. That's the, that's the cool part. So. At least I haven't had anybody yet. They're like not returning texts or tell me to go screw myself. You know, I, I usually have uh, everybody comes on wants to do it again. They have a good time. Uh, I have, I've had, to your point, I've had uh, one person uh, say that they they were going to be on it, and I had to go through their assistant, and a couple of times. And then it was when it was about to happen, the person said, "Oh well, like we're sitting down like you and I are now." She's like, "Oh, I gotta go. Uh, I'm going to go out to eat or something like that." And then we try to. They said, "You know, reschedule." And I sent them more stuff, and they never. It was it was just I just yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. just quit. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I feel bad. I, I, there's been a few people I've had to bump around because I would get a uh, this life, you know. Fi- hey, it's and you're gonna understand this is when you're a firefighter and you're trying to book a firefighter, you got two firefighter schedules trying to align mm-hmm. and 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 put aside some time. So when I say it's the weekly scrap, I'd love for it to be like every Thursday at seven. But right. the fact of the matter is, it just bounces around to whenever. You know, and I luckily you can schedule it online. So it's I, I give people like a three or four day notice. And that's that's kind of been helpful for it. Yeah. And once, and once you sign up for it or subscribe to it, you get a notification, you know, what's coming up on the scrap and stuff like that. And, and what's one t- of the thing is, too, is when you got people uh, on different time zones. Yes. So, yes. Like dealing and with- it's tough. It's tough. Uh, it, and it's an awesome problem to have. Like, again, this is not a complaint. It's there are so many passionate people in the fire service. And the Internet has brought us all closer together. And I like my guest list. I, there's so many people I, I a need to book, uh, have reached out to to book, but haven't quite followed up enough to get them booked. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a great problem to have. There's so many passionate people that have great messages. Yeah, yeah. And you know, when I first started out with this, you know, I was a nervous wreck. You know, even though I wanted to <laughs> yeah. talk, I was a nervous wreck. I'm like, oh, don't I don't want one o'clock to come because I got to do that damn podcast. Now it's like I can't wait. You know, I went to bed early last night just to make sure I was up to do all my stuff I needed to do to get this ready for this morning. Right. Um, so one of the things I learned about on the scrap, there's a cur- there's certain themes and, and generational stuff comes up all the time on the scrap. Yep. Um, I, I, there's some tactics and stuff that comes up, but again, if it did it all the time, I probably wouldn't listen because everybody has sure. their own view on that. I like, I like knowing about the person, but another thing that comes up and I want to talk to you about, and I see it being a theme everywhere is culture. Yes. What is wrong with the firehouse culture? What What is it? You've talked to these guys. You have your own opinion. What What is it? What is it about culture in the uh, the fire service right now? I think buzzwords is a big deal. Uh, and so like leadership went through its, its, its cycle. You know, everything was about leadership, leadership, right. leadership, leadership. And we've cycled through leadership and you're like, oh, don't write, you know, I just wrote a leadership book. And it's like, oh, don't write another, you know, and that's not a knock because it is, it is a timeless, um, timeless uh what is it concept uh, right. idea yeah, yeah you know I, like i said i always say this you know george washington was sitting around the campfire discussing leadership you know marcus aurelius back in the roman times was sitting around the the, the roman area <laughs> discussing uh leadership and 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 how to how to make it better and how to lead men and women and and people uh and so it's a timeless thing, but it, it, and now culture is, has bubbled up and it's now the buzzword as far, but it's still the same thing, you know, right. it's all the same thing. And so, uh, but what's wrong with it? I think it's, it, it's a pendulum swinging. And so you go from one extreme uh, to the other, one extreme, it, the fire service is really bad about just a slight little nudge correction. It's right. like, 
<laughs> you know, gravel to gravel across the pavement. And so, and I think that that the, the safety first culture just really was an overcorrection, you know, that everybody goes home, great message and everything like that. But really it got, uh, into we come before the citizens, you know, in that overcorrection. Right. And, and I think that that permeated a lot of cultures and uh, the attitude, which again, complacency is, you know, my buzzword that I fight so much against. And I think that complacent culture, the hardest battle you ever fight is the fight against complacency. Terry Scott said it, you know, to me so long ago, and it's true. It's been true since Marcus Aurelius was probably trying to fight complacency back in his day with the Roman legionnaires. <laughs> Would you please get on the horse? <laughs> yes. Well, we get paid the same whether we go or not. You <laughs> yeah. know? I could pay the same amount of money whether I fight this battle or not. Right. You know, and, and, and you know, why would you want to train with your, your little gladius sword? You know, <laughs> don't you know how to use it? I, you know what? I've gone to a lot of battles. I've had any trouble, so I don't need to change anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the one. It's always worked before. Yeah, yeah. So why would I want to? You know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the, the analogies we can make for the Roman engineer. We should do a whole podcast on that. <laughs> it's just bad analogies. We can mix our metaphors and everything. <laughs> but I think we're living right now through the the swing back towards, and there, and, and it's because a lot of people beating the drum of we we don't come before the citizens. You know, we it says fire service on the side of that that, right. that rig. You know, we're the fire department. We're here for them. And I, I, there's so many people beating that drum and. Uh, the message is being heard by the younger generation coming up and the culture is swinging back to a point of uh, aggressive. We're here because you know, it's worth the risk, you know, Kurt Isaacson's message. Uh, and I, and I think that is uh, the reason the culture is uh, bubbled back up to the surface. Well, I've, I've always been taught and I always believe in, you know, risk a little, save a little risk no, a lot no. to save a lot, risk nothing to save nothing. Unfortunately, that's very subjective to each person. Dude, a great point, man. I mean, new guys' aggressiveness versus our aggressiveness is there's miles between that. You know what I'm saying? No, Mike uh, Galliano in his go no go presentation, he asks everybody right out the front. You know, he he goes through the risk a lot, save a lot. You know, he goes, "What is a lot to you?" Raise your hand. Yeah. What What are you willing to risk to save my life or my you know my kid's life tonight? What are you willing to risk? Right. And, and, and he goes through the class and, and it's, it's so subjective, you know, cause some people will say my life, some people say everything, some people will say injury, you know, and it's just a really poignant point he makes and it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, we, every department has their, they're not firemen, they're, they're, you know, they're city employees. If they come on a city employee, their risk a lot it would be, you know, maybe I just don't want to get sweaty. I don't want to go into fire at all. Yeah. yeah I, I don't yeah. want to put myself in danger. Right. You know? Uh, for those of us that, you know, meant it and, you know, when we took the oath, you know, we, we do what we, but, you know, I've noticed too, and you can tell me you're you, you probably, now I'm probably getting ready to piss off a lot of people. <laughs> I love it when, I love it when it starts with that. Go. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, you know, anytime somebody says that and then puts bud in there too, like, you know, uh, I, I, I'm not trying to aggravate you with my political view, but, but. <laughs> um, I think that it can be misconstrued aggressive firefighter, Okay, which is a compliment. Uh, mm-hmm. Being called an aggressive firefighter is a compliment. It can be misconstrued as, you know, I'm going to go into places that I shouldn't go into. I mean, you got fire blown out of every window, every door, everything like that, and you try to get in there unsafe, I'm trying yes. to say. No. That could be the issue. So 100%. It, it's knowing that no one, the, the more years you get on, the more you know you can push. Absolutely. Now, some things that nothing's resi- going to replace experience. You know, you can, no. uh, but go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. You're right. Nothing. It's that experience that lets you know that. But my, my issue is you got an aggressive captain. You got a brand new, uh, maybe an overly aggressive. Let's say an overly oh. aggressive captain. Okay. Um, and then you got a brand new guy. Are you teaching him right? Are you teaching him wrong? Right. Uh, but no, I, you know what? We took that oath. And I believe, uh, I believe everybody that's not a firefighter goes to bed knowing that if something bad happens, we're going to do, we're going to move, you know, heaven and earth to get to them. Yes. And, and that's, that's what we need to do. That's why I we want have to be gear. the guy responding to my house. I, I really do mean that. I want to be the BC in charge. I want the shift I run. I want them responding if my house is on fire. Cause they, those guys are, I know that they have their shit in order. 
Right. And uh, uh, so that being said, not to brag on my guys, because I will, I'll sit here and brag on them all day long. So <laughs> That's your job. The best, best damn crew <laughs> on the MFD, probably in the metro area. But um, I'll stack them up against the country. But, uh, the, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the word aggressive, man, it's such, again, I'll get back to buzzwords. It has almost lost its meaning in, in how much it has been thrown around and used in social media. Yes. And I'm aggressive, I'm, you know, and it, it, to me, uh, man, if, if and, and again, I'll, I'll go right back to Mike Galliano and his his go no go because he talks about if we say we're going inside everything no matter what, then you could be a robot. A right. robot can make that choice. You know, yes, no. If we, if it's always hundred percent this, you know, there's we 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 are just our job is to think and problem solve and save lives. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. There is no hundred percent ever. Right. And so, but the cold, that's the, that's the danger of the switch. As we, like I said, back to the overcorrection and we skid back across the pavement to the other side, you know, if you don't have that, the knowledge of the tactics, building construction, fire behavior to make the call uh, on when to go and make that aggressive. And I use the word aggressive, but that uh, ballsy, whatever word you need to use. Right. But you, it has to be an intelligent decision. It can't be a, no matter what we do this. Right. It has to be backed by tactics, fire behavior, building construction, what is going on in that incident. It can't just be a checkbox. Either side. Yeah. So anyway, I don't want to overcorrect to the other side where we start getting people killed and hurt for nothing. So let me ask you this. Talking about culture and talking about the pendulum swing and where do you stand on clean cab? Clean cab is garbage. Ugh, expand on that, please. <laughs> Anything that delays any way, shape, or form us responding is uh, putting our safety in front of the citizens. And if you want to put it on cancer, then there's so many other things you could be pointing at to eliminate. The biggest thing is the off-gassing, man. I, I, I watched this YouTube video where they put the, the, the powdered dye on the gear and mm-hmm. then they drag it through the station and then they go through with the black light and show it everywhere. Clean your fucking gear. If your gear is dirty, don't put it in the cab. There you, you know go. what I'm saying? Okay, so yeah, I totally agree with you. And, and the words you use that I think is the most important is delay. Mm-hmm. So, and I think that's bad that the clean cab, talk about, you know, buzzwords, everybody is hating on clean cab right now. Right. I, I, here's why I like clean cab, but it's not the clean cab. All right, I'll, I'll listen, but I don't like it already. Go ahead. Here's why I like clean cab, but not the clean cab that manufacturers push. Okay. okay. And stick it on your word delay. Here's my idea of a clean cab. Okay. Clean the inside of your cab relentlessly. Not a problem. You're not delaying there because that's done in the firehouse before any fire. It's on, you know, when you're not doing anything, have two sets of gear if you can. So you 100%. have a clean set and you have, a, you know, when you go to a fire, yes. you can take your dirty set, do some gross decon, throw it on top in a garbage bag, put on your clean gear, get in the truck. That's no delay to the citizens, Right. You don't have to have a special truck. You're just trying. Now, you're not going to have 100% compliance, and I understand that. You know, don't take our SCBAs out. Uh, no. The cab, that, no. That, when I, when, when I say clean cab is garbage, that's what I'm discussing, is when you take the SCBAs yes. out of the compartment or out of the out of the cab. That's, I want to be specific. That's what I am discussing. You're talking about the delay, and, I, I've, I've, and I'll tell you another story. And I, it's, I don't want the, the SCBAs out of the cab. I think it makes more sense to clean these SCBAs better. Yes. And then if you if you're one of those departments can afford two sets of SEBAs, great. But I'm like you, I don't think it should be a delay. You can have you can have clean gear to and from a fire every time if you're fortunate enough to have clean gear. You have two sets of gear. So my idea of clean cab is that zero delays to the uh, citizens, but a little more effort to not give us cancer because I, you know it's I just think that's very important. And also you can go one step further as not much with clean cab, but cancer fighting. And, and that's a whole different podcast, but absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Wearing air packs during overhauls, cumbersome as miserable as they are. Uh, I've always told my guys, look, you're not going to be 75 pounds dying in front of your family on a hospital bed and say, at least I didn't have to wear my air pack and overhaul. No you doubt. Know? Hey, and, and if you really want to get serious about, about clean cab and, and, and cancer and man, you know, spend the whatever. I don't even know what a Nomex hood costs anymore. Buy freaking spare Nomex hoods and have them available all the time. Extra gloves. And get them off your damn neck. Yes, extra gloves, extra hoods. Because think yeah. about how many times you touch your face, do like this with you know, oh, rub yeah. your nose or mouth with a dirty glove. Um, so I try to have several sets of gloves. No, gloves is bought- a great point because I don't know any. You know, I, spare gloves would be huge. You know. Well, think about you know, it, you know, absorption, ingestion, inhalation. That's all in one swipe across your nose, and we all do it. So 
I, I, you get me fired I, up on clean cap. Sorry. Hey, no, listen, that's what it's all about. And I'm, I'm glad that I got you thinking that I was going to come back <laughs> at you like you're wrong. Um, <laughs> no, no, I think, I think it can be done smarter. I think manufacturers, um, unless they want to sponsor my podcast, in which case then they're right. But <laughs> until I get a sponsor, I, there shouldn't be a delay. And I think there's ways to do it without being delayed. Now, if you're a department that only can afford one set of gear, and then just do the best you can, grow Stecon on the scene afterwards. We should not delay our response for the citizens. That That's, yeah, they pay us. And everybody wants to say that, you know, they pay your paycheck, da, 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 da. I think differently. I think they go to bed at night knowing that if something goes bad, we're going to be there. Yes. So no, 100%. What's their expectation? Let's meet it. Uh, yeah. That's what they no, let's for. That's what, let's that's what they buy us gear for, you know, the tax bonds, whether you're volunteer or professional, you know, and, and, uh, but, uh, and I say professional, you know what I mean? But right. the, um, our, I'm very spoiled at my department. We are, we are extremely proactive in our, uh, we have, we have a, a loaner gear program where you can go in and check out gear that's your size whenever your gear is dirty. Well, we have an extractor at every station, which is a, which nice. is, you don't realize how, you know, for us, it's normal. Right. But that's that's a proactive chief that took care of that. And so we have a what decon pack. I don't know if you know, it's a little green thing. It was originally like a brush fire thing you could fight, mm -hmm. but it's got a wand. You hook it up to your discharge and you can decon on scene with a, nutri a, a citrus squeeze. Nice. And uh, it's it's beautiful. I, I made a Facebook post about us deconing after a fire and I'll, on not firehouse vigilance on our more fire department page. So a lot of people probably didn't see it. But the um, so I'm very spoiled when I talk about this stuff. Right. It's the fact that a lot of people don't have these options. So when I get passionate about it, I have to realize my perspective is, right. is skewed. So I want to qualify everything I said with that. My, I do have a skewed perspective. Yeah. Well, I do too. I mean, we, uh, to your point, I've got a chief that uh, gets us gear every five years. Mm. So we have two sets of gear, like we're getting some this year. Uh, we have two sets of gear within that 10 year NFPA 10 year span. Right. And, uh, but, you know, we, we can go a little bit further with deconning and stuff. Our, my department, there's no finish line. I mean, you just got to do the best you right. can. But I think the nugget that you build everything around is no delay in the citizens. That's it, man. Build, no, I mean, that, that's the side of our for. mission. We cannot yeah. lose sight of our mission. No. You know. Plus, if you're single, that's how you get girls because you're a badass fireman. Yeah, kicking indoors, <laughs> saving <laughs> babies, kissing ladies. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> Oh my goodness. So um, I'm gonna tell you a story about uh, uh, what I experienced from a guy that their department just started clean cab, but they started the real clean cab where they put their SEBAs on outside. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna tell you his story. It's not my story. Right on. And I wish I could, I, I did not get his name or I'd had him on here. Uh, it was in Arizona and I don't know what department he was uh, working for. But anyway, we're standing around waiting for the next evolution. And he, I heard him talking to his friend about clean cab. So I turned over and I said, Hey, so you guys do clean cab? Because yeah, we've been doing it for about you know six months to a year. I said, so has there been an issue? He goes, well, at first the guys didn't like it because they thought it was going to take longer, but it doesn't. I'm like, really? Yeah. He goes, no. He goes, once you get used to it, you know. He goes, you feel stupid putting your air packs on in at the fire. He goes, sure. he goes, but we try to make that time up in the in the uh, in the firehouse never make it up on the road and we try to get out a little bit quick he goes we try to make that time up and we have he goes it takes no more time to get in a burning building now with clean cab as it did before because we work with it he said but he did say like i said he goes you know you hate to pull up on a fire and put an air pack on yeah he goes but if you work with it and get it on quick he goes there's and, really I, no and delay. I get there's no delay my point is if there's someone hanging out a window and you come off the rig and, yes you know I, 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 man i i cannot see uh uh, uh, and again, we're getting in, you could what if and minutia to death, but yeah. you know, obviously on a bread and butter, you know, pull the line going in the front door, whether you spend the 30 seconds sticking it on before you get on the rig or 30 seconds on the scene, that doesn't matter. But when someone's hanging out a window and their, their skin's sloughing off, you know, that to me is a, is a difference. If you're going to stop and put an air pack on there, you know? So we would agree that air pack is probably the hang up more than anything. So, I mean, if you have clean gear or at least decon your gear and, de and decon yeah, your don't cab. Put dirty gear, don't put dirty gear in the cab and ride no. back with it off gassing and et cetera, et cetera. Go, oh, get, yeah. go take it back to the station, clean it up, and stick it back in your clean, nice, clean cab. Well, I had a guest on. His name is uh, Chief Bruce Dark, and he's dealing with colon cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And so we did a lot of cancer talking. Sure. And he found some stuff, and I, I got to get with him because I meant to ask him. It's a special type of cleaner for gear, I think. Mm -hmm. No, no, it's for masks. It's for masks. Okay. For masks. Anyway, he's used it on uh, air packs and it got them crazy clean. 
So oh, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know, he's, he's very cancer focused for him and his department. His sure. department has, has gone along uh, the journey with him and luckily has evolved with and because of him. So I need to get with him because one of the things I told him, one of the things we did is we took an air pack, cleaned it best we could, you know, soap and water, truck brush, blah, blah, blah. Right, right. When it was all clean and sprayed off, then we stuck it into a big container full of water, came back after a couple hours and that water was filthy just oh, filthy. Wow. So cleaning air packs, I think can be difficult. If you got an extractor for your gear, that's great. And I think Jeffersonville uh, fire department has mass cleaners and then they got that, whatever cleaning solution, whatever that's for, I need to find that out. I might put that on my uh, yeah. Facebook. I'd like but to know about they clean, it. They clean the air packs really well, which is my nice. point. So putting all your gear in a different place is not the answer. I don't think, I think just cleaning our gear a little bit better. Makes every, well, every and, and I, mean, I think there's a lot, lot, and this is just me, and I, I'm not backing this up with data or anything. It's anecdotal and completely my opinion, so take it for what it's worth. I try to never argue tactics right. with anybody because tactics are local. Right. You know, my, I, what I argue is whatever tactics you have, be proficient at them. Right. Be, be excellent. Uh, yes. you know, and so if you hate the triple load, that's fine. But if the triple load's what you have on your department, be excellent at deploying the triple load. Oh, absolutely. You know? I've and never so, understood. I don't understand that argument with the triple load. I'm one of those uh, idiots that love it. You know? <laughs> I but, mean, you it know, really depends on your district. We ran the triple load in more forever because it, you know, 90% of our homes are 60 foot setback, you know, yes, right exactly. Street. You know, it's, it's perfect for it. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, you know, but it really depends on your district and what you run. Well, to your point about, you know, be proficient at it. Like when I had Tony Carroll on, you know, DC firefighter, he said they got inch and a half cross lays. And he's yeah. like, you know, that's taboo. And he's like, no, it's, we're great with it. We do a lot of good work with it. And they yeah. still, to this day, they just, yeah. when they buy a new hose or whatever, they, that's what they have. So I'm not one of those that says, you know, you can't have a pistol or you can't have an automatic nozzle. Or you can't do this. Can't do it. Hey, if it works for you, man, if you're good at it, fucking go at it. Don't no, work. I have my opinions and I'll be opinionated about them. But at right. the end of the day, I'm not going to argue with you that I'm right and you're wrong. Yeah, because I don't work where you work. I don't have your staffing. I don't face your challenges, your setbacks, your building construction. It's like me. I'm I'm in Moore, Oklahoma. There's no such thing as a basement in Moore, Oklahoma, right. because we're we're on a river bottom bed, yeah. and so the water table doesn't allow basement. So I don't have to deal with basement fires. Uh, the oldest house in Moore, uh, I, there, I'm I'm sure there's probably some older ones, but uh, we don't have balloon frame construction. I don't have to deal with it. We have and tons so, of it. I'm, I'm, I'm spoiled in that regard. You know what I'm saying? So yes. I can't argue tactics with people o over, you know, they're like, yeah. Do you have I, mostly new construction? Oh yeah. Yeah. We, we're a boom bird. That, so that's, a, like that's we were, an animal all, all of its own too. 1960s was the, like when, when more kind of went on the map and then everything's been built since then. And then right. the boom over the last 10 years has been astronomical. Plus we get these things called tornado remodels every so often. So you'll have a, a, a something that was built in the sixties and seventies. And then, you know, tornado will come through and then right in the middle of it, you'll have houses all built in 2013. Oh. So you'll have legacy construction right next to brand new lightweight construction. Now, is it for you and more, is it easy to identify or usually, usually because the, the style of construction is pretty evident, like the, the better it, uh, the brick, you know, the, it, it sticks out like a sore thumb in amongst all the houses that were built in the sixties. Right. Wow. So it's not, it's not a, it's not like a trap where they, they historically match the look and you go inside and it's all lightweight. Right. Uh, so it's nothing like that. We get, we got a good combination where I'm at. We downtown, there's a ton of uh, balloon frame. And then there's uh, you know, our, our town is really doing pretty good. It's they're getting more and more businesses and more and more apartments. Uh, we're right across the river from Louisville, Kentucky, which is a, a real big city. Right. So we're getting a lot of lightweight construction, new stuff. And, you know, you hate to see four stories of wood. You really do. Right. No, <laughs> dude. Yeah. And this is like, holy crap. They're making that out of matchsticks. What's going on? Oh, yeah. And they do everything but like put, you know, balloons full of gasoline in there. <laughs> right. No, that's what it seems like. Yeah. So like we always go uh, when we do like uh, go in and, and look at new construction, while they're going we just had a hotel like last year they were doing it was all lightweight we we're going through there and that we're picking crazy, it apart it? just the amount of wood when they put up them them hotels a six-story oh hotel God. and it's like whoa yep it's all two by fours yep and then uh we also have a, a new uh older folks home that has it's it's lightweight construction but it's got uh a light concrete on each floor oh wow concrete. Yeah. yeah yeah the lightweight so, concrete floors yeah Oof. yeah but you're working on building construction PowerPoint. You have for a while now, haven't you? Man, it's like it's like the I, my guy. I was coming off duty this morning, and my guys <laughs> asked me about it, and I actually showed them what I. It's it's like a two year project, 
and it, yeah. it's it's morphed, and so it's now called street reading, and so it's morphed. So it includes all the building because the original idea behind it was the guys we're hiring now don't have the background in the trades that we used to. Yes, you know, agreed. Um, even me, I, I I laid tile most of my my career is my day off job, so I was involved in construction in some way, shape, or form. I'm a pretty good guy to remodel, um, but. I, I was kind of an exception to the rule for my generation as far as still being in a trade. Right. And, and they're just gone now. They, they don't exist. Hard. They're the massive exception to the rule to have somebody come in, you know, you got to teach them how to mix, you know, gas in a, in a two, uh, uh, two cycle yeah. engine. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, 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 and what's the difference between a two stroke and yeah. a four stroke? <laughs> yeah. This, the, the society in the, the, what am I trying to say? The values that are, they're just not needed. Right. You know, and so it's no, not, I'm not sitting here bashing on the younger generation. I'm not, we have to train them that this is a blue collar job. And, and the two pillars of firefighting are fire behavior and building construction. And the fact that building construction is no longer a given, uh, I'm on a tirade, I'm sorry, but that's the reason I started building that building construction presentation was directed at the younger generation, but it's, it's morphed because it's a, a, I'm not a subject matter or expert on building construction. There's guys out there that know, way more than me. And so I'm trying to get good, solid information into it. You know, the, what's the thing they always say, vet your instructor, you mm-hmm. know, check the resume. Yeah. My resume is I laid tile for 15 years and, and know how to <laughs> fling some sheetrock and put on a roof. Oh. Uh, that's my resume when it comes to building construction and, and in the 24 years in the fire service. So I'm trying to really put together solid information in this presentation. Uh, but I'm very proud of it. And even this morning, I, I, because it's funny you brought that one up. Uh, I actually was on my phone sitting there showing them where I was at on building it and explaining to them what I meant by street reading. So it's morphed into building construction mixed with how to have a successful pre-incident walkthrough and understanding the the purpose of a building mm-hmm. and all these little tips. Anyway, someday it will be finished. I, don't I would love that. to see that when you're done because like you, I struggle with building construction. I try to read as much as I can. Right. Uh, but I'll, they'll never call me little Frank Brannigan. That's for sure. I mean, right. No, I get it happen. completely. So that's great that you're doing that. And I like the idea that you're doing it from a perspective that wasn't your own. I think that's pretty cool. I've had a few classes like that where you have instructors and they're giving you information, but not from their experience and their their point of view. Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, this is for other people. That's got to be difficult, though, to do. It really makes it it really slows down the process, because when it's when I when I feel like I'm a subject, like if you want to talk about culture or leadership or relationship building or trust or communication or discipline, I, I feel like I'm a subject matter expert on those because I have spent most of my adult life studying those subjects. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and applying uh, said learned uh, stuff to those subjects. But so I'll, I'll discuss those all day and, and feel like I'm coming from a position of, if not authority, at least experience, if that makes sense. Right. Yes. So yes. When I'm, it comes to this one, I have, I don't feel like I'm coming from a position of authority. So I'm triple vetting everything that I put into it uh, and making sure that it, it, it comes across clearly that I'm not doing this as a subject matter expert. I'm doing this as an informative, uh, this is what I have researched and learned and I'm passing on. So with construction, it, the, they change how they make houses and stuff so much and build other buildings. Have you found yourself in the past two years having to go back and change stuff because you're like, oh, shit, this isn't as important or now there's something new and different I need to add to it? A cool part about street reading, the presentation is that it really deals with concepts more than concrete. This is how they're like, uh, like uh, I'll try to give a good example, but I want to. And it's hard to explain without giving you the presentation. But <laughs> I, hey, we got uh, time, brother. <laughs> Chris Tobin, uh, Chris Tobin, St. Louis Fire. He's on Rescue 2, I believe. I may have got the rig wrong, but uh, he did. A, he does a presentation called Dare to Save. And it's his, you know, it's a great uh, 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 presentation. And he'll be going through his presentation and he'll stop right in the middle and just do a tidbit. That's like a, a tip on insert whatever. It could be building construction. It could be fire attack. It could be hose deployment. Mm-hmm. And, he, and then after that tidbit's over, he'll go right back into uh, his presentation. And it's a great little breakup of the, of the class. And so what I've done is completely ripped off Chris Tobin. Thank you, Chris. And <laughs> I put in there these things called blue breaks. So I'll be going through the presentation talking about, you know, whatever it is, you know, the purpose of uh, a building, you know, and all of a sudden it'll pop up and it'll be a big blue screen. It says blue break. And it'll, it'll be, so for example, the very first one is hip and gable. So like, the reason is very, very basic. You probably know the difference between a hip and a gable on a roof. Mm-hmm. But when you 
talked to one of my rookies that just got hired. He's 19 years old. And I asked him, Hey, you know, the difference between a hip and a gable, they just kind of get the glassy eyed look and look at you like, what are you talking about? Your hips right here. I don't know what a gable is. <laughs> and so, and then I break down a ridge line and, and, uh, and then of course where you never want to cut. And then the slides are all animated to show these things. And then the blue break is over, but it gets that, that little uh, point across to them. People who already know it aren't bored by it, but right. it gets the point across. And then the, the presentation goes on. And then, so I build these blue breaks throughout. I don't even remember why I started talking about it, but anyway. <laughs> I, I like that idea too, because, you know, my, my boss always says that, you know, the, the brain can only take in what the ass can stand. So, Ooh. you know, if you're sitting in a, a chair, like for me, I've noticed as being, I've been a training officer now for my department seven, going on my eighth year, that if I have them in a classroom for more than two hours, yeah, unless I'm doing a, a PowerPoint on nude celebrities, I'm, I've right. lost them. You lost now, them. I put them outside with a tool in their hand. I get about three to four hours of, of good training. But so that's that's my go to is I, I got two and four, two and four. So I got to break the bigger things up a little bit. Um, but the blue break to me seems like a great idea. If you got him in a seat in the room, it's winter, you're not doing a lot of training outside. Uh, those blue breaks seem like a really good idea because it's, it's going to, if you're starting to see guys snap off a little bit, right? Go, hey, let's talk about this for a quick second. And then they might get more involved more. And again. that's exactly how Chris does it in his presentation. And it, it worked great. So again, thank you, Chris. I stole it from you. Yeah. When, uh, when I used to teach uh, instructor one for a fire school around here, it's, it's the driest, worst you know, it's 40 hours of just, you know, terribleness. So right. I, I used to put pictures, uh, internet memes and stuff, just all of a sudden, I wouldn't tell them what's coming up. Like right. there's this guy that's kind of half naked with bacon all over him, a bacon man. And so whenever I got to a point that I thought was important to remember, the very next slide was bacon man. Bacon man. So when we did our summary, I'm like, okay, guys, think bacon man. And they go, oh yeah, that's, yeah, okay, I get it. I got it, got it. No, so, that, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, you do. You really do. Because I mean, you really want to get your point across. We talked about how you got started on this. You wanted to share your knowledge. And I've always said that knowledge not shared isn't knowledge. There's right. two steps to knowledge. It's learning something and sharing something. And what we're doing here in the fire service, what you're doing, what I'm doing, what all these good firefighters are doing are they're sharing what they, they know. And right. I, you know, I just, you know, I have actually heard people say, Hey, don't worry about that. You got 20 years to learn it. Right. No. Yeah. That attitude is so, yeah. Well, now one thing I will, I will say this cause you're a training officer. So you have, and I'm not, so I, in my department, I'm not, I love, uh, I love building presentations and sharing knowledge. So the cool advantage I have that you don't have the luxury of it in your job is that you have to teach that 40 hour dry ass stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, I get the luxury of picking my subject matter and spicing it up how I feel is a better, you know, where you don't have the luxury to do that. So I, I that, that it's kind of apples and oranges as far as when you have, if you have to train to assert and they have a, the syllabus that says you got to spend yes. 30 minutes on this and 45 minutes on this. And, and you know, the training to the certs to me is, is it was needed at one point in the fire service. And now I think has become a detriment to our uh, ability to learn what is needed. Well, yeah, there's not to your, yeah, yeah, there's not a lot of uh, a wiggle room in some of that stuff when I think there should be a, a lot of, where the information is, there needs to be experience points. You need to be able right. to put your own experience to that. Well, and just like tactics are local, you know, so is training. Training yeah. is local. You it know what I'm saying? Is. I'm wanting to do a little series here, and I've already I've looked uh, where the hottest spot is in, in America and the coldest spot, and I'm going to talk to their training officers and see how their, their training is different. So no the doubt. hottest that's, – That's a great point. I, I think it's kind of cool, right? So yeah. the Phoenix is consistently hotter than any other place – in the United sure. States. Yeah. So we get a hold of their guy there. And then I forget where in Alaska, uh, it's a small, well, there's a place in Alaska that you have a fire department. It's actually the coldest. And then okay. there's another place, but I would love to do back to back interviews and find out what their differences are because I'm interested because I got guys that if it's 90 degrees, they absolutely won't train. Right. You know, or they do nothing by complaint. And I understand, I understand yeah. that, you know, Hey, this is miserable, possibly dangerous. I get that. Right. Okay. But there's things things we can do to make things better. I don't mean start training when it's 90 degrees. I'll right. start training when it, in the morning. If once it hits 90, they're like, fuck, we're out. Right. You know, I'm like, let's, you know, Hey, let's, let's throw some water. You can take your gear off and have, you know, helmet and gloves. You know, you're not burning up, but that's me. Uh, and I made a couple of mistakes when I first became a training <laughs> officer, training a little too hot. Uh, but I'm interested in how they do it. Cause when I go to Sarasota, I go to Siesta key every year with uh, my lovely bride uh, for vacation and there's the Sarasota tower. So I go down there in July. 
Right. And what's hot as balls and cheaper. Um, and I always see firefighters in gear training, pulling hose and doing stuff. Right. And I've always thought, no. hey, you know, how come you're doing this in 90 degrees, but people maybe, you know, wherever can't do it in 90 degrees. I like to know what the mentality is there. Cause that's really it's culture. It's, be. it's culture. Yeah, and it's culture. we'll go right back to that buzzword and it is culture. And, uh, Scott Thompson, chief Scott Thompson, the colony, man, if you ever, the greatest book on culture, you can read is functional fire company, uh, chief Scott Thompson, read it. And I think that should be mandatory reading for everybody in the fire service. Church. So church and you have a great list i don't know if you've updated it but every time i have it man i'm so far behind. I, I i'm so far behind on my building construction presentation so far behind on uh, everything but uh yeah the the so book list is way behind for for those listening i want to explain how devoted corley is to you guys hearing a message from heavy hitters <laughs> so or not just heavy hitters but just a message so when i was asked to be on we we're a couple hours away from doing our podcast you were on i was on your podcast right and you're like, hey, I just landed. I just want to grab a quick bite to eat. And then we'll do the weekly scrap. I'm like, dude, if you want to you know, take your time, you went straight from an expo, not only where you did a podcast, but you took classes, hands-on classes, Yes. flew all day, come back, and then deal with me. I mean, you could have easily, to be honest with you, what I'd have probably done, I've been tuckered out. I've been like, oh, can we reschedule this? But you're just like, oh, no, let me eat, and then we'll be good. And we had no, a long I get, time. I get it. Part of it is my own uh bad scheduling like my scheduling board is this whiteboard <laughs> up here but part of it's my own my own fault for putting that on myself because i'm like okay what day am i getting back from florida well we're flying back on monday you know or, or actually i look and i see oh the, the the expo ends on the sixth well that's fine i'll have jake on the seventh you know or whatever the dates were i don't remember because in my mind i'm the the, the expo's over on the sixth i get back on the seventh or i, I have the scrap on the seventh well no the expo ends on the sixth i fly back on the seventh so <laughs> part of it's just on me for being a bad planner but the other part is is uh, I love the scrap. The scrap is like, like, like you said earlier, I look forward to it. You know, yes. it's my catharsis. It's my, uh, I don't know how to, it's just, I, I enjoy it. Yes. If I didn't, it would have died probably a long time ago as an inconvenience, but I love it. So, um, I don't remember what else I was saying. Cause I lost my train of thought, but I love the scrap. So it's not a, uh, uh, it's not work. Right. If that makes sense. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, I don't know. I, it's, it's, it's hard for other people to understand. And I hope people out there listening will start their own podcast because there's zero competition amongst firefighters and podcasts. Zero. No, that's it. Yeah. They, I've never seen a more supportive group of people. No, it, it absolutely is. And you make, you make good friends with heavy hitters and you quickly realize that these guys that you, you've looked up to and read their books, articles, or pod, listen to their podcasts, they're about as humble as they come. I think, it's, I think that the, the, the best – all share that humility and that's why they're the best. Yes. If I, I think if they don't have that, they're not, they don't get there. You know what I'm saying? They, yeah. they stumble in their own way. So it's, it's like a self uh, regulating for them to get to that level. You can't be an asshole. No. And also chances are, if you're at that level, you fucked up a lot along the journey. Right. You know? <laughs> and learn those yeah. lessons. <laughs> you know, isn't it nice to hear some of these guys that, you know, you, you, you've read their articles, seen their interviews, and you're like, this guy's got it figured out. Then you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one and they say, oh, yeah, you know, I was terrible at this point, or I didn't do this right, or I didn't do that right. And it, it humanizes them a little bit more. Oh, and I, I've never met somebody that wants to be at the level I see them, you know? You can't help but go Aaron Fields, he's, you know, Mark Van Off, and they're at these right. levels. And then you talk to people like that, and you're like, wow, they're just like me. They're just right. – and that really changes the whole – the whole podcast because you're like, just again, having conversations. Right. No, it's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. Well, let me ask I you something it. else. Okay. Let's so tell, tell me if I'm wrong. You've talked to a lot of guys and, and you got your opinions. The new generation is absolutely without a doubt ruining the fire department. They're losing the tradition. Uh, people are going to die now and fires are just going to take over the world. Is that correct? That's I, I, you just summed up the modern American fire service, right? <laughs> that well, that's their opinion. What what if you? No. What do you think? <laughs> I like and anybody who has that opinion. I'm just like I, you want to look at them and say, what are you doing to fix it? Yes, that's the whole point. Is any 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 tool bag can come along and point out a problem? Is it a problem that the younger generation doesn't care as much? Pro yeah, is it the downfall of the American fire service? Absolutely not. It's like if they don't know the traditions, whose fault is that? Right. Exactly. Are they supposed to walk in? Is there some book they can go read that has the history of the Moore Fire Department in it? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It, what traditions did you start at your department that they've forgotten? 
You know, that's what I want to ask them. It's, it's uh, to me, it's so disingenuous. It's a straw man. It's usually made by people who don't want to train, who don't want to take the time to, and I say train, who don't want to put in effort of any sort to better themselves, better their department. So it's easier to say these guys are ruining it. We've always put out fires here and these guys are ruining it. And we don't, yeah, anyway, sorry. I don't know. No, if it, no I, that's, <laughs> that's exact. I've heard, I've heard you talk about generation. That's why I was kind of, I was kind of picking at you a little bit. Gotcha, I, gotcha. I, knew, I know what your thought is. I personally think that, you know, the, so I don't think traditions have gone away because of the newer generation. The timing is there, but the traditions have gone away because more people have cell phones or social media and you can't do what you used to do 20 years ago. We have some traditions That's, 20 years ago. Yeah, they get you fired nowadays. There's no yeah, doubt about it. Um, one, um, I tell you what, let's try something here. Tell me, the, tell me you think the neatest tradition you've ever been involved in. Neatest tradition, man. I, I, we recently, and this is recent. That's why I say, what traditions have you started? So, uh, obviously, if you're a, a 200 year old department, then then you're going to have some cool stuff to fall back on. Mm-hmm. More more blew up in the 1960s. So, at best, uh, the department I would say has been around as a as a legitimate municipal fire department for about 40 years. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, before that, it was very hodgepodge. So, there's not a ton of history to call upon. Uh, but that's no excuse because a tradition, you can't have a tradition unless you start it. Right. So, and I, that's my number one message I want to get to people. You can't have a tradition unless you start it. So if someone hasn't started it before you start one now. So our training division, uh, just two rookie classes ago, made it to where they go out and they buy a, a pickhead ax or a flathead ax, but they go out and buy an ax and they go out and they bury it in a field. And uh, the, the new rookie class is to go out and find it, dig it up, clean it up. And then they have to come up with the motto. And then all the names of the rookies are engraved on the ax. Actually it's powder coated onto it because one of our guys is a, is a awesome powder coater. And um, they get to pick a motto and put their names on it. And then that ax goes on the wall and now there's two axes and the next rookie class is going to do it again. Oh, that's and I think neat. that's a, yeah, I think it's a phenomenal tradition, but it's only a couple of years old. What but, about traditions that, that you had that happened to you? That you were Happens part of. Yeah. Like when you're I a brand new guy. Man, most of it, I would say, is stuff that had to go away because the society has changed. <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess the word is hazing or yeah. I, I don't feel hazed or bullied ever. But no, 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 no. But it's but a different still, world now we live could, in. Yeah, you couldn't do it now. Right. There's stuff that. you couldn't do now. You know, I've had my bed flowered. I've had uh, uh, they, they did away with messing with bunker gear because, you know, that's just a taboo. Yes. Um, and that's a good thing. Because, you know, filling up the boots with water and things like that. I'm trying to think of all the different stuff, man. Uh, like you said, some stuff is, 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 is because of the optional clothing involved. Yes. And, and so, yeah, I've, I, I don't have any specifics I would point at. So. I'll, I'll give you a good one. Uh, yeah. Lexington, Kentucky. I don't know if they still do this. So Lexington's a pretty big department. Uh, they got like, I think, 23 stations now. And their main station, station one, houses, you know, First off, it's headquarters, and then it also has, you know, truck one, engine one, EC one, the, the squad. Uh, they have maintenance. There's a ton of people. There's a lot going on. So when you're a new guy and you, you get assigned there like I did, you're not allowed to eat in the kitchen until you make potato soup at midnight. So you got it. They've had it forever, and they have the truck. Right. Yeah. So – but it's not just that easy. So like when I was there, they had a firehouse dog, Bell. So the dog was – they would bring the dog in the kitchen to eat dinner, and then we had to sit on the tailboard and eat dinner. And then when everybody's done with dinner, you had to clean up. Clean so up. After right. about a week or two, you had to make potato soup at midnight. So this is a big deal for the people that are not making the potato soup, the new guys, the subs is what they called us. So as you make potato soup, they try to get in there and pour all kinds of stuff in there, like, a, a, you know, food coloring and stuff to change the color. Right. So, and it takes, you know, quite a, quite a while to make potato soup. So sure. you got to have one sub guard it. And then they're always trying to get around to do it. And then at midnight, they had us call all the chiefs in the middle of the night and invite them to potato soup. So, they, yeah. yeah. So they'd give us a list of people that we had to call. Chief, I forget the, the chief that I had to call, but I called him and he knew it was coming. So he got his right. wife and daughter into play. So his wife answered and said, look, I'm going to do you a favor, new guy. I'm not going to wake my husband up, you know. Uh, you're, I don't know who you are, what you think you're doing, but you're calling the chief so-and-so on us. Okay. So I hung up and they go, well, sub, did you get him? And I said, well, his wife answered and said, you know, he's asleep. And they said, you need to call him. He has to be here or you're not going to get in the kitchen. 
So I made a couple of <laughs> phone calls and they kept telling me, just give me help. And then finally the new guy, the, the chief got on the phone and ripped my ass, ripped it. What are you doing calling? I don't care if they're pranking you, blah, blah, blah. And I'm scared to death. And all the other sure. chiefs were doing it to the other guys calling. And right. then at midnight, when it's time to serve, all those chiefs showed up and they were as nice as could be. Dude, and that's awesome, man. And that's the part. Them. Yeah. That's the part that makes the tradition so powerful is that they were bought in. Yes. Yes. It was and it was miserable as a sub, but looking back on it, I was glad I was I was part of some of these traditions. And and then when you're chiefing it up, you better be doing it at midnight with every rookie class. <laughs> I left. I was only there for eight years, so I didn't get gotcha. to be a chief there. <laughs> but yeah, it was pretty neat. I like that. Not every department, did, not every station did that. They didn't have the means, but there it was. So I, I was always thought it was kind of cool. And it was no, also man. fun to see people deal with it once I was there for a little bit. Sure. Watch new guys try to make potato soup, and I got to be the one to try to pour you know, food coloring in there. Whatever in it. Too. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah. No, I love those stories, man. That's one of the reasons I love National Fire Radio guys and the stuff they pull out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Their yeah. culture and tradition. I love those guys. So They just visited some uh, firehouse in Houston, I think. Yeah, they were down in Texas way. Yeah, yeah. And I they saw were that. 68. I think it was 68. I could be wrong. Yeah. But I, I'm pretty sure I was looking at that post yesterday. So That'd be pretty cool just to be sitting there all of a sudden they walk in and like, oh, shit, how are you? How are you guys doing? Yeah. Jeremy and Rob. <laughs> no, it's awesome. Well, brother... I'm about ready to wrap this up. What do you think? I, you let me you let me ramble for a long time, man. I think I ran long on you. I'm sorry. You know, you didn't run long at all, man. I, I could sit here and talk another hour with you. Um, the, I do want to talk about one more thing, though. Hit me. So I apologize. I got to apologize, Chief Corley Moore. I had no idea you wrote a book. The day really? I found, yes, I had no idea. Uh, I knew you from Weekly Scrap, Firehouse sure. Vigilance, but somehow that slipped. I rectified it by the day I found out I ordered me a book. So I look forward to getting that book and I will definitely uh, bug you about it. I can't wait to read it because I know, I know a lot of your theories already just from listening sure. to your, your thing. So I'm really excited to have in book form so I can highlight it and right do on. what I did to Jared's and, and Joshua Chase's book as well. Well, you got to remember the, the, the challenger leadership, which is the book is uh, it's a different kind of book. It's, I always tell people it's, I just, I, it was written to be read by firemen. It, it's written to be pe- read by people who don't like to read people who are more men of action. Right. So that's the whole reason for the challenge is every, each page is, is designed to be read in like three or four minutes, five minutes tops. If you're a truckie. Right. So, and so you uh, got one syllable words in there. Right. Words. Very short, very, very fireman friendly. And so you read the one page and it's a concept of leadership or culture or whatever word you want, you know, uh, relationship building, trust, uh, you know, conflict management, uh, just one, page and then the second page is a challenge to be completed that goes with it there's a hundred challenges and that's why it's called challenge of leadership and it's but it's designed to be action nice. and uh and so hopefully you know I, and the reason you don't know about it is i'm a terrible self-promoter it's, <laughs> i don't uh i'm just and you have it's funny about that you have the platform to sell anything that you you make that's funny i just i'm not good i'm not that's not my uh, that's really not my <laughs> message i guess i don't know so Anyway, I'm not good at it. So, but yeah, thank you for bringing it up. Well, do me a favor. Tell me, um, tell me where they can find your book. Uh, Firehousevigilance.com. If you want it to be signed by me, because that's one I send out for my house. Uh, just put in there a note that you, what you want it to say, if you want it signed. Um, if you don't care about getting it signed, you can find it on Amazon, which is super convenient because Amazon's a lot, lot uh, more good at, more gooder. More gooder. <laughs> more gooderist at shipping stuff than I am. So, but I, I love it when people order them. I love putting a message in it and sending it off. And, and uh, I love hearing, uh, more importantly, I love hearing back what you think of the book. So if you do get it, let me know. I love, uh, you know, hearing it. So now, am I getting a signature on my book? Oh, yeah. I signed yours. <sighs> yes. I, I, I'm surprised you hadn't got it yet because I dropped it in. Of course, I don't spring for the two day prime shipping. So you, you got like a four or five day wait for it to arrive. Right. And to, to my uh, listeners out there, if you have a challenge coin, send it to Corley Moore. 100%. He, he collects them. And where should they send that to? Uh, if you want, by 1028 Northwest 1st, Moore, Oklahoma, 73160. That's the address. Uh, but yeah, I love featuring challenge coins. I've tried to, it's a new thing I'm doing on, on the end of almost every scrap is I feature a coin that someone has sent to me, especially if you can give me the history of the coin. I love, love, love hearing the symbolism on the coin and what each thing means because uh, the fire service is so creative in what they do with those things. So uh, if you want to send one, I, I will feature it on the scrap. And I'll also put that in my description as well as firehousevigilance.com and tell them how they can find weekly scrap on weekly podcast scrap. and on YouTube. 
the podcast you should be able to find. I think I'm on every platform available. Uh, so I, if there's one, let me know and I'll try to. iHeartRadio was so tough. It took me like a year to get on iHeartRadio for whatever reason, but finally it's on there. But uh, so you can find the podcast anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Uh, to catch the scrap live, it goes out live on Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, you can look at Firehouse Vigilance's page and there'll be events on there and you can sign up for the event. There's no cost ever. Just show up and, and participate. Leave your comments and your questions because the audience is really one of the things that makes the scrap so magical and fun. Good deal. Anywhere, anywhere else they can find you or get a hold of you? Social media, if, you, if, you, if you're on it, look for Firehouse Vigilance. Usually I'm there. I'm not on TikTok. I don't do the arm dances very good. <sighs> I wish you um, <laughs> I'm working on them. I'm working on them. But, uh, but uh, other than that, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube, some of them, I'm, there's more of a presence than others, but that's it. All right, brother. As always, a good, good talking to you. And I uh, hope you don't think it's the last time you're going to be on Three Point Firefighter. Hey, just let me know, brother. I had a blast today. This was exciting. Good deal, man. Good deal. I did too. I look forward. We had, to, I was nervous about doing yours. It was the first one I've, I've ever been asked to do. So I was super nervous. You made me feel comfortable right off the bat because, you know, when you do weekly scrap, you're on a couple minutes early to talk about, you know, audio, stuff like that. Sure. And you totally made me feel comfortable. And, 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 and just like I say, it's a nice little conversation. I appreciate it, brother. Hey, good times, brother. Thank you. All right, man. I will talk to you later, Chief. You have a good one. Corley was a great guest. We talked for another hour after the podcast. He and his guests definitely keep me motivated to keep trying to do better and better at the job every single day. I can't recommend Firehouse Vigilance and the Weekly Scrap enough. I really enjoy both of those things. I hope you enjoyed this episode and you look forward to the next one. Remember, stay safe, have fun. I mean, after all, it's the best job in the world.